Now, the topic we have before us tonight is the Lord Jesus as the door. And first of all, we are going to read from John's Gospel. In order to have the whole context, I read as of verse 1. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that enters not in by the door to the fold of the sheep, but mounts, mounts up elsewhere, he is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has put forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will not follow a stranger, but will flee from him because they know not the voice of strangers. This allegory spoke Jesus to them, but they did not know what it was of which he spoke to them. Jesus therefore said again to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enter in by me, he shall be saved, and he shall, shall go in and shall go out and shall find pasture. So far, the word of God. You have been considering during the last months some of these great statements, I am. There are seven in the Gospel of John. The Lord Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door, the topic of tonight. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and life. And I am the true vine. Seven great statements that show us who the Lord Jesus is. It is one thing to consider what he has done and that is great. And we are more than thankful for all that the Lord Jesus has, doing, has been doing for us and is still doing for us. But it is a different thing to see and to consider, to focus on who he is. Of course, we can never separate these two things, what he is and what he does. But we can distinguish them a little bit. If we consider who he is, I am, we see the greatness of the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who became man. And we focus on his personal glory. Now tonight we have this statement, I am the door. Now there is a background against which the Lord Jesus he spoke these words, I am the door. In John chapter 9, we have this man who was born blind and who was healed by the Lord Jesus. And then this man was cast out by the religious people of that time. The Pharisees, they put him out. They excluded them. And then in verse 39 of chapter 9, the Lord Jesus says, For judgment I come into this world, that they which see not may see, and they which see, or which pretend to see, may become blind. Here we see two different groups, those whose eyes are open and those who are blind, spiritually speaking, open eyes or blind eyes. Two groups of people 
among the Jewish nation at the time when the Lord Jesus was here on earth. And you get these two groups back in chapter 10. The Lord Jesus speaks of his sheep, that is the group of those whose eyes have been opened, and then the Lord Jesus promised them that he would get them out of the fold of that Jewish, Jewish system. He also speaks of these thieves and robbers, these wrong spiritual leaders who thought their eyes were opened, but in reality they were blind. And against this background, the Lord Jesus speaks about a door, a door to go in and to go out, and a door to protect. And if we consider the text, the verses we have read, we see that there are three or three times a door is mentioned. So we get three different doors here. The first door is in verse 2. He that enters in by the door is the shepherd. We know the Lord Jesus is the shepherd. He is the good shepherd. But here he says he enters in by a door. We will see that this is the door of the scriptures of the Old Testament. Then secondly, in verse 8, we have a door and the Lord Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. This, this is the door by which those Jewish sheep could go out of the fold. And then thirdly, in verse 9, the Lord Jesus says in a very general way, I am the door. And that is something that also applies to us. That is a general statement. I am the door. Now, very briefly, that first door, I said that is the door of scriptures. Here, the Lord Jesus says, there is a fold, and in this fold, there are sheep. The fold and the sheep, or the fold of the sheep, that is Israel, as a nation. Israel was like in a fold. God put them in there. He had separated his earthly people from among the nations which were around Israel and they were his sheep. There was a fence around that fold and that fence was the law. A fence separates and the law separated Israel from the nations. In the language of Ephesians 2, that is the middle wall of partition. Then we have thieves and robbers who came in, who pretended to be shepherds, but they were not. These are the religious leaders of Israel, and they cared more for themselves than they cared for the sheep. Then we read of a porter who lets in the good shepherd, and this porter, of course, speaks of the Holy Spirit, who in the Old Testament has already spoken about the Messiah, who would come, and the conditions he has to fulfill. And then the Lord Jesus says that he has entered by the door. In the Old Testament, it was clearly told what character the Messiah, the shepherd of the sheep, would have. And the Lord Jesus, he has fulfilled all the conditions that were mentioned in the Old Testament. He entered by the door, by what had been told in the Old Testament. Let us very briefly turn to John chapter 1, just to prove that in verse 
44, John chapter 1, 44, we read Philip, who, or in chapter 40, uh, verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses wrote in the law and the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph. So the Lord Jesus came into the fold. He came to his earthly people and he used the door. He fulfilled all the requirements that were given in the Old Testament. Well, we know the story. The Jews in general did not accept the Lord Jesus. And therefore, he speaks about a second door. And he said, I am the door of the sheep. In order to let out those who belong to him. We read he calls his own sheep by name. That is this Jewish remnant who really accepted Christ as the Messiah when he came. Like the disciples or like Mary and others, they were his sheep. He called them by name and he let them out. He let them out of this Jewish system. Step by step, these Jewish believers had to leave the Jewish system through a door. And this door is the Lord Jesus. I said step by step. If you consider, for example, the first letter of the New Testament, not the letter to the Romans, that is the first one in our Bibles, but not the first letter that has been written, no, the letter that James wrote to these Jewish people, we see that they were still half in that fold. They still went to the synagogues, they still went to the temple, and so on. They, they hold the law and all these kind of things. But if then we turn to Hebrews chapter 13, that is a well-known verse, and we very often apply that to us. But the first application is to Jewish believers. Uh, Hebrews 13, verse 13. Therefore, let us, the sheep, those Jewish People who belong to the Lord Jesus, who were Christians, let us therefore go forth to him without the camp. The camp, that is the fold. They had to go out and the Lord Jesus let them out. Under his direction, these believers here are called to go out. And they went or they had to go out to him. Now, of course, dear friends, we can apply this to us because we also know that the Lord Jesus calls us by name. That is a great thought, isn't it? That the Lord Jesus knows our names. We all, as his sheep, have a personal relationship to him. He knows you and he knows me. He knows you by name. And he knows me by name. There is a very personal relationship. And the Lord Jesus, of course, is the one who leads us. We are not considering the Lord Jesus tonight as the shepherd, but this is one characteristic of the shepherd. He goes before the sheep. He sets the example. He shows the way. And we follow him. And what we just read in Hebrews chapter 13, of course, applies also to us. We go out, out of the religious systems of modern Christianity. We have to separate. We go out. It, normally, it's not a pleasant thing to separate. It's not a pleasant thing to go out. But here, the, the one who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews, he said, let us go forth to him without the camp is the Lord Jesus, the great leader. He is outside the camp. He was crucified outside Jerusalem. And he is outside those 
religious systems which are around in our days, we go out. We just gather unto his name. We share his place of resurrection. That is the second door, the door to go out. Now let us consider the third door in verse 9 where the Lord Jesus says, I am the door. He does not say I'm the door of the sheep, but in a very general sense, he says, I am the door. And that is a great statement. Just four words, but it's worth to consider these four words. First of all, I would like to emphasize that the Lord Jesus says, I am the door. He personally is the door. The Son of God became man in order to be our door to salvation. We enter him by, we enter in by him. I am the door, no one else. The eternal Son of God, who became flesh, who became man, who died on the cross, he says, I am the door. No saint, no angel, no one else could be that door. I am the door. That is the first emphasis. And how grateful we are that the Lord Jesus himself is the door. Secondly, second emphasize is I am the door. He does not say I was the door or I will be the door, but he says, I am the door. That is a general statement that is valid at any time. It is a timeless statement. The Lord Jesus is the door. If any would come to God, whenever and wherever, he is the door. And now, today, this door is still open and the statement is still valid. I am the door. Thirdly, we can underline that the Lord Jesus says, I am the door. He is not just a door and maybe there are others. No, he is the door. We know the Lord Jesus is the good shepherd. We can even say he is my good shepherd. It does not, it is not enough to know that he is a good shepherd. This has often been emphasized. And the same is valid when we consider the door. I am the door. There is only one door to come to God. There is only one way. I am the way. And the Lord Jesus is the door. Let us just read from Acts chapter 4. I'm sorry, I can't quote that by heart. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. That is a well-known verse. And salvation is in none other. For neither is there any, uh, is there another name unto heaven which is given among men by which we must be saved. Sometimes we sing with our children, there is no other way. Neither is there salvation in any but Jesus. There is no other way. I am the door. That is very exclusive. Only one way to come to God. And that is the door. That is the Lord Jesus himself. And fourthly, we emphasize I am am the door. Now, what is a door good for? We all live in a house, in a flat, in a, an apartment or wherever, and we use our entrance door every time we want to leave and every time we return. We use the door, be it the front door or we be it the back door. We don't enter by a window or by whatever. We use a door. 
Now, a door, we go in and we go out. Now, first of all, we go in. If we think about salvation, we go in. We receive salvation in passing through the door. And I'm sure and I hope we all have done that. We have used the door. Go in and go out. But there is a second thing a door is good for. Normally, at night time, we close our doors. We lock them. We bar them. We don't want anybody to enter, thieves or robbers, so we close our doors and we use a good protection device. Now, a door is also there to protect us. And you see, this is exactly what the Lord Jesus has done. If we have entered by the door, we are safe. We have received salvation. Behind that door, we are safe. So we have entered and we are safe. And we will see later on that we will also go out and then come back. That speaks of Christian liberty, of the, the freedom that we have to go out and to go in. But the, the, the main thought is we enter and we are safe. Now, the point, of course, is that we have to use the door. It's not enough to know that the Lord Jesus is the door, that he is the way to salvation. We might know that, and yet we are lost. We have to use the door. We have to enter it. It's just one step. But we have to accept Jesus. We have to take in Jesus into our life. We have to come to him confessing our sins, to repent and to accept him as the one who died for us. Let us not forget the day will come. We don't know when. The day will come when the door shall be closed when it will no longer be possible to use that door. But still, today is a day of salvation, and the door is wide open for anyone who wants to come. And that leads me to the next statement in verse 9. If anyone enter in by me, he shall be saved. If anyone shall enter in by me. Again, I would like to emphasize four things. We have seen four words. I am the door. Now I would like to emphasize four things in this statement. If anyone enters in by me. There is an if. One of these famous if clauses. There is a condition that shows that not all will use that door. If, then. But not all, unfortunately, not all use this door. There are those who would not love to enter, who reject to enter, who try to use maybe other doors, but they will not lead to salvation. They will not lead to God. He is the door. But if anyone enter in by me, secondly, anyone, anyone. He does not speak of the, of the sheep of, of, of Israel. He does not speak of Europeans, of Africans, or whatever. No, he says, anyone. Who is anyone? Anyone is everybody. Everybody is invited to use that door. The Lord Jesus does not force anyone to use, to enter by that door, but the door is wide open for whosoever believes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. The door is wide open for all who would like to come. Then the third emphasis is if anyone enter in by me. This is what I already said. People have to enter. They have to use the door. Now, how do we enter by that door? And the answer is we enter in by faith. We cannot pay an entrance fee. We know there are certain things around and you want to enter entertainment or whatever, and you have to pay an entrance fee. You want to enter a museum or a swimming pool or whatever, you have to pay an entrance fee, an admission fee. But here, you don't have to pay. You cannot pay. It's impossible to pay. We enter by faith. It's free, but faith is needed. Now, what is faith? Faith is the hand that trusts God. We put by faith our hand on all that God has promised. We enter in by faith. We take God at his word. So we enter. And the ticket to enter, if I may say so, is faith. We have to believe. Those who believe, they can enter. Faith is needed. And then again, the Lord Jesus says, that it is only by me. If anyone enter in by me. The Lord Jesus, I repeat, is the only way to come to God. And his death and his rather resurrection were needed. I read another well-known verse in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. Again, I can't quote it by heart. Verse 28, come to me, all ye who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Dear friends, how grateful are we that we have entered by that, by that door. The Lord Jesus himself, the door we have entered by him. He is the mediator between God and us. Now we have seen four words, I am the door. Then we have considered these four statements. If anyone enters, it's conditional. If anyone enters, the door is open for whosoever will come in. We have thirdly to enter in by faith. And again, fourthly, it is by the Lord Jesus, the only mediator between God and man. Now to finish, I would like to show four great blessings that are related to the fact that the Lord Jesus is the door. I reread verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enter in by me, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and go out, and shall find pasture. And then I read also verse 10. I haven't read that in the beginning. I should have read it. The thief comes not, but that he may steal and kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. So here you get four great blessings. The first blessing is he shall be safe. That is salvation. The second great blessing is he shall go in and go out. That is Christian liberty. Then thirdly, we read he shall find pasture. That is spiritual 
food and satisfaction. And then fourthly, that they might have life and might have it abundantly. That is, of course, eternal life. Four great blessings that we would just like to consider very briefly. The first is salvation. He shall be safe. Salvation is one of the great topics of the whole Bible. You get salvation in the Old Testament and you get salvation in the New Testament. And to consider salvation truth, our great salvation, that is a very important topic. And I would recommend to all of you this little booklet of Mr. Hole, The Great Salvation. I read it when I was a very young man many, many years ago, and I read it with, with great blessing. The great salvation. That is all the Lord Jesus has provided for us lost sinners in the Lord Jesus. Salvation. Now, the general sense in salvation is to take somebody out of a danger. And you see, this is exactly what the Lord Jesus has done. And here, when he says they shall be saved, the meaning is saved in a very general sense. Now, there are two expressions in the New Testament that belong together, but yet we have to distinguish them. That is our calling and our salvation. And in many scriptures that we read, Salvation has to do from where we have been saved or from what we have been saved. Salvation looks backward. Where did we come from? Whereas in many cases, not always, but in many cases, uh, our calling looks in, in the future to where we have been called, onwards and upwards, a heavenly calling. We have been called to be sons of God, adoption, childhood, all this, to all this we have been called. So salvation looks back for, backward from where, from where we have come. For example, we have been saved from our sins. Our sins made a separation between us and the holy God. And how grateful we are that we have been saved by our sins, from our sins. The Lord Jesus took our sins on him on the cruel cross of Calvary in order to save us from our salvation, from our sins. We have been saved from the power of darkness. We were slaves. We were bound. And our master was a cruel master. It was Satan, the devil. But we have been saved from the power of of darkness. We have been saved from condemnation. We all, by nature, were under condemnation. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been saved from condemnation. We have been saved from the coming, coming wrath. First Thessalonians chapter 1. The Lord Jesus will save us from the coming wrath. The, the wrath that comes over the earth during the period of tribulation. We will see that later on tonight, but also from the eternal wrath that is on all those who die in their sins. We have been saved from the wrath of God, that righteous God, that righteous wrath of God. We have been saved of hell. Our final destiny would have been hell if the Lord Jesus had not saved us. But grace and praise to God, we are saved. The Lord Jesus Christ has saved us. Now, you might know that salvation in the New Testament, I don't want to enter into too many details, that salvation has three different aspects. We can look back to the past and we can say we have salvation we are saved we have the salvation of our souls 
that is a fact, a matter of fact. We have it. We know that there are scriptures that speak about our present salvation from all the dangers that are around in this world. Remember, salvation means to take somebody out of a danger. Now, this world is dangerous. There are lots of dangers, lots of snares. We need salvation every day. And the Lord Jesus gives us salvation. He shall be saved. And thirdly, we look forward into the future. We will be saved. We await the Lord Jesus as Savior. Philippians chapter 3 at the end. Why that? Because our bodies are not yet saved. Our bodies are not yet part of that great salvation, but they will. Our bodies are still poor and weak and feeble. But the day will come when our bodies will be transformed and they will be like his body of glory. Salvation, that is a wonderful subject. And dear friends, let us never forget, in order to obtain that great salvation, the Lord Jesus had to go to Calvary's cross. He had to lay down his life. He had to die for our sins. He had to die in order to make us free. There was a great price that had to be paid. And the Lord Jesus paid. He paid what we could never pay. But he paid for it. He gave his life. Oh, what a wonderful savior is Jesus, our Lord, who went to that cruel cross to die for poor sinners, for those like you and me. He has obtained, he has acquired our great salvation. All glory to our Savior. Second blessing, those who have used the door, they shall go in and they shall go out. Now, that is a big difference when we compare that with the Jewish fold. Those who were in the Jewish, Jewish fold, they were in, but they could never go out. It was forbidden to go out. There was this fence, the law, the separation wall, middle part, uh, wall of petition. But we have Christian liberty. We are not under law. There is no fence around. This door is open to go in. And to go out. Now, this is another aspect, of course. We go in in order to be saved, but now that is a different aspect. We go in and we go out. That is Christian liberty. And I would like to, 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 to link that to the two priesthoods that we find in 1 Peter chapter 2. Maybe we can very briefly consider that there is. A holy priesthood, we go in to the sanctuary, the holy place, in order to offer spiritual sacrifices. And then we go out as a kingly priesthood, as a royal priesthood, verse 9. But ye are a chosen race, a kingly or royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for a possession that ye might set forth the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness to his wonderful light. Now we go in and we consider the Lord Jesus as the one who died on the cross. Holy priesthood. Of course, we do that when we are gathered in order to break bread. But that is not limited to this one hour on the Lord's Day morning when we come together. We can always go in into the holiest, into the, the sanctuary, and there we consider the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. We are occupied with that unique sacrifice. We offer sacrifices of praise when we consider the Lord Jesus as he died. 
But then we go out. We go out to show forth the excellencies, the glories, the perfections of the one who died on the cross. We invite others to come. In order to invite others to come, we have to go out. This is what the Lord Jesus uh, told his disciples. The great commandment at the end before he left to go back to his father. He said, go out, preach the gospel. Be my be those who, who testify of me. We have to go out. So we have go in and we can go out. Then the third blessing is we shall find pasture. Those who know the Lord Jesus as their personal savior, those who have eternal life, they need spiritual food. And where do we get that spiritual food? Dear friends, we don't get it in the world. We get it from the Lord Jesus. He leads us on these green pastures. He gives us all that we need. By the way, he himself is the food. You have considered that I am the bread of life. We have to eat that bread initially in order to be safe but we eat it every day the manna in the, in the in the desert speaks of christ and that is the spiritual food we need we need to be occupied to focus on the lord jesus how he left here how he he lived here on earth how he died on calvary's cross how he went back to the father how he is now glorified in heaven that is our food, the Lord Jesus, the manna, and also the food, of course, in the country, in our blessed Cana. And then the fourth blessing, not to be too long, is I am come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. To have life, of course, that is necessary for those who were dead. Forgiveness for those who had sinned. Freedom for those who were slaves. But life for those who were dead. Mm -hmm. Now, by nature, we all were dead. Not physically dead, but spiritually dead. And to be dead means to be separated. Death, death speaks of separation. If we die, soul and spirit are separated from our bodies. So spiritually, we were dead. That is what Ephesians tells us, dead in sins and trespasses. And we couldn't change it. We needed somebody else to give us life, to impart life. And this is what the Lord Jesus, what God has done in his son. Now, to have life, that is already something that was known in the Old Testament. Also, the Old Testament the, uh, believers, they needed life. But here the Lord Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. And I think this is a clear reference to what we know in the Christian area in the christian age the christian dispensation that is eternal life it's not just life but it's life abundantly the richest form of life that is eternal life that is a life without beginning and a life without end and we know that eternal life is not just a matter it is not just a thing that has been imparted but uh, john says at the end of his first uh, epistle in chapter 5 that the Lord Jesus himself is the eternal life. Our life is Christ. And that was something at least unknown in the Old Testament. But we know Christ is our life. Eternal life. We have it. What a wonderful, what a great blessing. I dare say that this might be the greatest blessing that we have, eternal life. The faculty 
the capacity to have communication, relationship, fellowship with the eternal Son and the eternal Father. That is what the Lord Jesus says in John chapter 17, right at the beginning. I would just like to read that. Uh, verse 3, and this is the eternal life, that is the faculty, the capacity of eternal life, that they should know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I am the door. The door is wide open, not just for salvation. Yes, in the context of John 10, it's related more, more, mostly to salvation. But if we connect that to John 17, it is a door to eternal life. The final, the ultimate blessing that we have. We know the true and eternal God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. What a, what a wonderful blessing. Four great blessings. Salvation. We have been taken out of any danger. We have the second blessing. We go in and we go out. Holy priesthood and royal priesthood. We will find pasture as long as we are here in the desert. And the last blessing is life eternal. You see, when we are in heaven, salvation is no more needed. It is completed. There is no more need to go in and to go out. Forever we will be in, in the house of the Father. There is no need to have a look for these green pastures. We need them here on earth. But life eternal, life in abundance, that is something we will enjoy forever in the house of our Father. I am the door. What a great statement of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a great blessing that we have entered through him to come to God our Father. Blessed be his name.